to Allah, we seek His help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, is his servant and messenger. In Surah Al-Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Holy Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayyuhal lazina amadu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, fear Allah, be mindful of Allah as his due, and do not die except as Muslims in submission to him. And in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verses 70 and 71, in the same fashion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayyuhal lazina amadu taqullaha, yaqudu qawlan salila, yuslih lakum a'malakum, wa ya'fir lakum dhunubakum, faman yuti Allah wa rasoolahu, faqad faza faqza nazima. O you who have believed, fear Allah, be mindful of Allah, and always say a word directed to the truth, that he may make your conduct whole and sound, and forgive you for your sins, he that obeys Allah and his messenger has then attained the highest achievement. In Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse 285, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Amen al-Rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wa al-mu'minun, kullun amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rasulih, la nifarruq bayna ahadim min rasulih, wa qalu sami'na wa ta'na, the Messenger has believed in what was revealed to him from his Lord, and so have the believers. All of them have believed in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers, saying, we make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, we hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you, is the final destination. Dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, fall, at least formally, has started. The seasons may seem confused and confusing, but we are in the month of September. With September, schools start, so it is back to school time for uh, many of us. For those who are students, they are back to school, for parents, I guess they are mostly happy that the schools have started. The Sunday schools, Saturday schools will start soon and there will be an interactive period of learning and teaching. So I thought this would be a good time to reflect on how does Islam approach teaching and learning? What is the Muslim or Islamic pedag pedagogy, in other words, if we can call one? right? This is important because it is not merely theoretical experience for us. At the masjid community, the weekend schools, or the week-long you know, schooling programs, educational programs are important. At home, for those of us who are parents, or who engage with students in different capacities, maybe as teachers, it is important for us to bring our faith and our religion into uh, this uh, structure. In Islam, obviously, we have the best teacher, we have the best textbook or the guidebook, and we have, hopefully, a good community of learners. There is a certain level of hierarchy when we talk about teaching and learning in Islam, right? Our Rab, our Creator, our Teacher, Allah, is the one that has all knowledge and that gives all knowledge. We are the ones who are learning and we are the ones who are putting this into practice. Our Creator, in other words, is the penultimate teacher and the one that possesses all knowledge. There is no way that we can approximate that. In the case of the Quran, and we are going to look at the case of the Quran, how the Quran teaches us certain aspects and how our Prophet ﷺ as the best of teachers in the world is putting this into practice and will try to derive some lessons home so that we can all apply these 
in our personal lives as we develop masjid programs, as we go home and interact with students, or as we are teaching someone, even in an informal capacity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah the Exalted, with His ultimate mercy, not only sent the humankind to earth, but also has taught us from the beginning. We believe this, right? How does Islam, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, however, allow us to drive points home? What is the relationship between theory and pratik and practice in Islam? In the verse that we have read in the beginning from Surah Al-Baqarah, right? We are recommended to read Amal uh, al-Rasul every night. We say, Samiyana wa ta'una. We hear and we obey. Islam is a religion of not merely theory, but is a religion that's based on practice. It's a religion that asks us to develop not only taqlid, not only imitating others or seeing with example, but also tahqiq, but also of examination and of understanding things. Perhaps the proper, the full life of Prophet wasallam is full of teachings in this regard, how he has approached his uh, companions, how he has taught them certain things, how he was willing to engage in dialogue with them in a manner and as part of his teaching, right? as part of this broader idea of tarbiyah, of the soul, of the physique, and of the mentality of the human being. And in a way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has engaged the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and has set an example in this regard. Maybe one of the best examples, however long it is, comes from Hadith Jibreel, right? We all know, which explains us what Iman is, what Islam is, what Ihsan is. But maybe I thought it would be helpful to just briefly cover it and also try to think about what is some of the the teaching techniques involved here. What is some of the pedagogy involved in here? So as Umar radiallahu an narrates to us, right, he's saying one day we were sitting with the Messenger of Allah and there appeared before us a man dressed in extremely white clothes and with very black hair. No traces of journeying were visible on him, there was no dirt on him. And this was a time when people, when they traveled, when it was someone not known, it would be shown that they would have signs of travel. The person, the traveler, according to Amr as he narrates, he sat down close by the Prophet, rested his knee against his thighs and said, O oh Muhammad, inform me about Islam. In response, the Messenger of Allah Prophet ﷺ said, Islam is that you should testify that there is no deity save Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger and that you should perform salah and pay the zakah fast during Ramadan and perform hajj, the pilgrimage to the house, to the Kaaba if you can find a way to do it. Meaning if you have the means, if you have the ability to do it. And the traveler man in response said, you have spoken truly. Umar right. continues to narrate saying, we were astonished at this questioning of, of this man and then telling to the Prophet that he was right. right. Who is this person to first come and ask a question to the Prophet in questioning mode and then say, approve of him. Yes, you were right. Thumbs up. Who is this person? But he continues. A second question, right? And the Prophet, this is an example for us, is not is answering the question here. They are engaging in a dialogue. The second question comes, inform me about Iman, about faith. The Messenger of Allah answered, it is that you believe in Allah and His angels and His books and His Messenger and in the last day and in faith, in Qadr, both in its good and its evil aspect. And again, the traveling man says, you have spoken truly. 
I'll stop here before moving on to the next part to invite us to reflect on this. This questioning, it teaches us what Islam and what Iman is. The five pillars of Islam and then the six principles of Iman. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala could have said this to the Prophet and the Prophet could have engaged. What is the purpose of this man? And as we will see at the end, the Prophet revealed that the traveling man was, was Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. Right? What is the purpose for this? We can reflect and we can think that this dialogue, this example, and this question and answer method is important as a teaching tool. And the Prophet is engaging in this. And continuing, right, he asks a third question. Inform me about Ihsan, about Excel. And the Messenger of Allah answers, it is that you should serve Allah as though you could see Him. For though you cannot see him, yet he sees you. And then the traveling person questions again, inform me about the R, and then in, in, in the uh, benefit of time, I'll cut this short. But the Prophet says about that one, the question knows no more than the questioner. About the end of time. When will it be? When is the R? And here again we see another important principle in teaching and learning, which is humility. Saying that I don't know, I don't have the answer. Not shying away from saying that my knowledge is limited. And this is partly a root cause of much of the crisis that we are going through, the faith crisis, broadly. There are other important elements, people's struggles and as such, but one element is this idea that our human faculty is unlimited, that we'll be able to get all knowledge, that everything should be given to us in formula that is immediately, readily intelligible and explainable to our human limited faculty. And we see even in the case of the Prophet wasallam that he teaches a lesson saying, I don't know any more than you. Right? That's another important point for us to keep in mind and not shy away from this. Imagine a young person asking you a question. Rather than shunning it or rather than trying to find a way around to find an answer, something intelligible, which is you'll be inclined to do it might be best to say, it's a good question. I also don't have the answer. Let's look into this. Let's explore it. Let's find the answer together. This can happen at school. This can happen when students are doing homework. This can happen during Sunday school, Saturday school, doing our religious teaching. And as many scholars mention, that we should be wary of people who don't admit to the limited nature of their knowledge. Because all human knowledge, even for the most learned person, is at the end of the day limited. But to bring this to a conclusion briefly, right, he is asked, then the person asks again, this time the signs of end of times, and then the Prophet gives a few signs. And when the man goes away, Umar continues to narrate, he says, I waited a while, and then the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, Omar, do you know who that questioner was? I replied, Omar says, Allah and his Messenger know better. Right? Again, humility and being engaged and respecting the teacher, that's another important aspect. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, that was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. So Hadith Jibreel, arguably one of the most important uh, text sources for our religion, right, gives us and tells us the importance of this dialogic teaching and learning. Also tells us that the idea of respecting usul, respecting methodology in this way, one by one explaining is important. <coughs> And that it is important to be humble in the process of learning and in the process of teaching. 
Inshallah, in the second part, we'll try to focus and reflect back on the verses that we have read in the beginning. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الله سبحانه وتعالى when he teaches us in the Quran when he teaches us in the example of in the Sunnah of our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gives us always examples and the ability to bring back anything that is in the realm of ideas and theory into practice. The idea of Semirna Vatana, we hear and we obey. The idea of combining theoretical knowledge with practice is central in our religion. In Surah Al Inshirah, chapter 94, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Did we not believe your heart for your prophet and remove the burden that weighed so heavily on your back and raise your reputation high? So truly where there is hardship, there is ease. Truly where there is hardship, there is also ease. The moment you are freed of one task to work on and turn to your Lord for everything. Even in this example we see that life continues in progressions. That we shouldn't approach things as unilinear. We shouldn't approach things as steady. Neither is knowledge, right? When Allah says, when there is hardship with ease, indeed, when there is hardship with ease, that also applies to our life in regards to learning. Allah says, think about what has happened to you. So this is an invitation to combine theoretical knowledge with practice and reflecting on life experience. Right? Because the Prophet here is invited, right? أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكْ وَوَدَعْنَا عَنْكَ وِذْرَكْ أَلَّذِي يَنْغَضَ زَهْرَكْ وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكْ فَإِنَّمَا الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى إِنَّمَا الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى Allah says, yes, you are experiencing difficulty, but haven't we shown you another example? Reflect on it. So in a way, if we come back to the verses that we have read in the beginning, and Hadith Jibreel, and think about our Prophet's example, how he has engaged with his companions, how he took time to explain to them. How he even invited dissent, respectful dissent, quote unquote, or disagreement from his companions. Right? The case of Uhud. The idea of running ideas together with your companions. That's what we see as an important teaching and learning moment from the life of Prophet. In the Battle of Handag, right? getting ideas and applying it in real life. That's another important example for us. So in a way, if you think there are a few ideas that come clear from our religion and how it approaches the idea of teaching and learning. First, we recognize that there is knowledge and there is knowledge. There is Allah's knowledge unlimited and all encompassing and then there is human knowledge that is limited by nature that can be perfected, but it will always remain limited. Second, the idea that in Islam, theory and practice goes hand in hand. That we will learn things in ideational realm, in theory, but we will always try and take it and apply in our lives. Allah says, this is your religion, and we say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَتَعْنَا when we say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, we say, Rabbana wa laka alhamd. We combine these two and always emphasize practice. So that's why, especially in our home lives, it's important and crucial that we engage, especially with the young ones,
together, one-on-one -on -one teaching, coming from a place of love and coming from a place of spending time together. Many experts, community experts, say that one of the main issues that our community faces is that usually the teaching at home is not emphasized enough. That mashallah, alhamdulillah, our masajid, including this one, does a great job with teaching programs and all. But still, the main teaching happens through that close relationship at home. And that if we want our children to pray, that is what they are going to look at, the practice. Whether the idea and the instruction is there, yes, but if they see us pray, if they see us do certain things, inshallah, it will be all the more easier. It will facilitate them taking on these aspects. <coughs> Third, love and closeness, as the Prophet ﷺ has exhibited with his ummah, with his sahabis, with his ashab, is an important point for us. And finally, again, it is our relationship with the, with the Qur'an, with Allah's book, that will allow us to, inshallah, not only educate ourselves in this theme, but also find these examples and apply them in our daily lives, inshallah ta'ala. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be the best Amen. learners of this religion, we pray that we are facilitated in our studies, in our understanding, in our fahm of this religion, and that we are enabled not only understanding of it, but also putting it in the best way to practice in the best, uh, following the best example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala keeps us on firm ground and purifies our intentions, and that He gives us direction, and that He does never makes us prisoners of our own desires and whims. Mm -hmm. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlooks our shortcomings and forgives us for our sins. Mm -hmm. We pray that all the oppressed, all the suppressed reaches relief as soon as possible. We pray for all those Muslims everywhere, all corners of uh, the world who are suffering under wars, under famine and under difficult mm -hmm. conditions, including here in our own cities, people who are suffering from different problems. And we pray that we are united in being a relief and being a help to uh, everyone, both our communities, Muslim and otherwise. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites us with our uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his jannah and all our loved ones. And that Allah enables us to serve our communities and humble ourselves in practice. And that we pray for the facilitation of the good work of Masajid like this one is doing and that they are enabled in their service. We seek that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the knowledge that we seek. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barik ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirat hasanatan wa qadha azab al-nar. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. We close with Surah Al-Nahl, chapter 16, verse 90, which is yet another example of the idea of this reflecting and putting things into practice. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'muru bid'adi wa lihsan wa ita izr gurba wa yanha wa yanha an al-fahshai wa al-munkir wa al-ba'd. Ya'idhukum na'allakum tazakkaroon. God commands justice, doing good and generosity toward relatives, and He forbids what is shameful, blameworthy and oppressive. He teaches you so that you may take heed.